Okay, good evening again, colleagues. Welcome to the 22nd edition of the Tourism Online Forum series in April 2024. And tonight we are delighted to have uh, you joining us for this event, and uh, uh, which is hosted by the Center for the Once Tourism Research Cats at Hokkaido University. And this is your host, Mo. For this evening session, it is indeed an honor to have Dr. Dieter K. Muller to share his recent research about a second home tourism, mobilities, and local development. So Professor Muller is uh, in human geography, Umea uh, University, Sweden, and where he also in 1999 received his PhD on uh, CSIS address the international second home ownership. Since then, he has continued to devolve into various aspects of second home tourism. Published, for example, in two volumes of mobility, tourism, and second homes, Between Elite Landscape and a Common Ground, 2004, and the Rodledge Handbook of the Second Home Tourism and Mobilities in 2018, both co edited with uh, the famous McCall, right? In addition, uh, Muller has developed a research interest for the economic geographies of uh, Arctic tourism and other tourism in peripheral areas, particularly focus uh, have been on the position of indigenous people in tourism and the labor market issue in those Northern regions. Actually, that's another topic we would like to invite you to talk in future. <laughs> it's highly relevant to Hokkaido. And between 2008 and 2020, uh, Professor Muller has been a member of the International Geographic Union Commission for Tourism, Leisure, and Global Changes, serving since 2012, also as a chairperson. That's where we meet in the IGU. And today he is a co-editor of the Springer book series, Tourism and Global Change, and has various editorial roles for journals such as uh, 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 Scandinavia Journal of Hospitality and Tourism, Tourism Geographies and Current Issue in Tourism, Tourism and Hospitality Management. And this one is very difficult to read. Uh, can you pronounce that? <laughs> Sorry. How to pronounce Which one? Uh, the Jewish Week für Tourism Wissenschaft. Zeitschrift für Tourismuswissenschaft. Okay, thank you. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. And uh, yeah, and since 2023, he is an uh, elected member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Science. And today his keyword is second homes, mobilities, local development, digi digital transformation, and destinations. And please note that this online lecture will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel of the Center of Advanced Tourism Research in Hokkaido University. So let's invite Professor Dieter Muller to share his lecture. And please leave your comments and questions below in the Q&A box anytime. We, uh, yes, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you, you very Bob. much. And I will thank you very much for this very nice introduction. And I will try to do whatever people do in these cases to share my presentation. And I hope you see the, the right picture and I will talk about second home mobilities and local development. And as Mo already said, I mean, I have worked on, on this topic quite extensively. Um, just need to be able to move my slides. Yeah, here we go. And uh, and here are some of the books that I, that I published. I mean, it's uh, now more than 30 years ago, actually, that I started to work on second homes. And uh, it's 30 years ago that I had my first publication on the topic. And there are actually very few people around who have done uh, work on that particular topic for such a long time. And... Um, and actually, I mean, we tried also as a university, Ume University, uh, in, in the Department of Geography to, to really profile on the topic. So today we are actually at the department, four or five people working on the topic of second homes and tourism in particular. Uh, so, so in a way, if you would like to do work on second homes, I mean, you should probably come by at one stage uh, to Ume University and talk to me and my colleagues about this. And... Um, in a way, I will start with, with this quote, and it's in Swedish, as you see, utan den våre halv, and that means without it, I would be half. And that was uh, the answer that we got on a questionnaire where we asked people to, 
to say what the second home means for them. And and I think, I mean, some people wonder, I mean, why do you study second homes instead of importance? And, and I usually say, yes, it is, because it's very important to people. And uh, and particularly in, in the part of the world where I reside in, in Northern Europe, uh, I mean, uh, in Sweden, and but also in our neighboring countries, Norway, Finland, and so on, uh, second homes are a very important uh, thing. And uh, actually, more than 50% of the population would have access to a second home in, in those countries. So it's not it's not something that is only for elites. It's something that is very much uh, kind of a part of folklore and, and folkloristic kind of practices in the population. And, and in a way, you could argue it's some kind of individualized mass tourism. It's what people do. And, and just to give you a scope of, of, of the phenomenon, if we look at the, the overnight stays outside your own home in, in a Swedish context, out of 100, uh, 50% of the overnight stays that you will stay outside your own home will be with friends and relatives. Uh, 30 on the top of those 50 will be in second homes. And 20 are all commercial overnight stays that we do. So it's actually a quite substantial part of tourism in the Nordic countries and in Sweden in particular. Not only in the Nordic countries, I should say, I don't know actually how it is in Japan, but I know in other countries like uh, in, in North America with the, with, the, with Canada and, and uh, the US, but also in Spain, Italy, Second home is a quite widespread phenomenon, and and so it is also in in um, uh, Australia and uh, and uh, New Zealand, for instance. So so it's kind of a, a pretty widespread phenomenon. I will start to talk a little bit about the history of second homes, and uh, just to to also point out that this is not a recent phenomenon. It is a phenomenon that started already. In, in, in the Nordic context uh, in the late 19th century. And uh, actually it was the bourgeois classes, the rich ones the, in, in, the, in the city of Stockholm who wanted to come, who wanted to flee in a way the, the, the city in the summertime to get out into the countryside. At that time, obviously there were no cars, there were no roads, but in the in Stockholm context, there were steamboats uh, so there was a steamboat connection into the archipelago of Stockholm. And you see on the map kind of the, the dark gray area is the old part of Stockholm. And you see the, the orange line and that de delimitates the area where these kind of first second homes were built. And, and they were built at, uh, at uh, where, where the steamboats would go. And... Um, and those villas, they were kind of, um, you know, pretty, pretty expensive. I mean, they were, they were bourgeois, simply. It was a rich overclass that had access to those. But what we saw, and you see a picture of that in, in, uh, in the slide as well. Uh, but uh, this behavior of, of spending the summertime in the sherries, in the, in the archipelago, was uh, Early in the twentieth century, in the twenties and thirties of the nineteen twenties of the of the twentieth century, it was copied by by an increasing group of population, and they built um, with the same. I mean, they were dependent on the same infrastructure, the the steamboats, but they would reach more out into the into the archipelago and also into the more inland areas. And you see that delimited by the blue line on the map, uh, kind of indicating where those people would go for for um, their, their building their smaller cabins. And the idea historically was more that you could build a, a simple cabin and you could actually tear it down again and build it up somewhere else. Um, so it was almost like a tent, kind of, an ex, kind of a modern version of a tent, but that never happened. Uh, so, so they are still there. They are still there and they are today almost heritage buildings in, this, in themselves. The big, the big expansion comes, however, first after the Second World War in the middle, in the in the middle of the the twentieth century, where where tourism becomes more and more also a question of of, um, of social welfare, and uh, and uh, actually the Swedish government um, put um, uh, policies in place that uh, supported people to build their own second homes somewhere in in the countryside. And and so second home was 
kind of was the the form of of um, of domestic tourism and you see from this from the 1950s to the 1990s the number of second homes increased to about 700,000 and that is still where we are today about 700,000 uh, second homes in Sweden on a population of about 10 million people um so so just to give you an impression of how how much that is um why did people do that? I mean, this is a, a table taken from a, a study that we did on, on the Swedish West Coast and where we asked Norwegian second home owners who came by from ne nearby Oslo and, and Swedish second home owners. Why do you go there? We ask them and or we ask them more exactly. I mean, how important are different items uh, for your decision to have a second home? And staying, spending time at the seaside was a very important, was the most dominant motive for, for staying at a second home. And you see that in the table here, relaxation, scenic beauty, family cohesion, to keep the family together or gather the family, outdoor recreation, contrast to everyday life, uh, also for the children's sake, were very important uh, reasons. But what we also see is that there are differences between here, the different groups where the Norwegians were more into kind of relaxation and investment and, and status with their second home, while the Swedes uh, were more into the scenic beauty and the family cohesion aspect. So, so it was a little bit this, but also physical work. So indicating that this was also, you know, kind of a, a, a question of, of having fun in, in kind of in a, in a way that was not able in a city for some of them. So people would change the urban apartment with a small cabin in a countryside and uh, and be able to garden, uh, to, to, you know, do things that you can do outdoors. Uh, so so there are different motives for different people to have a second home. But, but in general, I mean, these motives that I have here on the slide are also to be found in other studies on the same topic. Um, if we look at uh, at uh, the writings on second homes, the first, I mean, the first studies, they were done already in the 1920s and 1930s. But the big breakthrough, in a way, the first major publication uh, was in the 1950s by a American or a Canadian geographer uh, with the name of uh, Roy Wolfe, um, who is also today kind of a um, kind of a still an icon in North American uh, tourism and recreation geographies, but but the the, the first major publication, the first collection of of case studies from around the world was published in 1977 uh, by by John T. Kopok, and it was a book that in a way asked this kind of question that you see on the slide here: Is it a curse or a blessing? Are second homes good or bad? And the basic, the basic um, point of departure for this book was the sheer, there was the insight that uh, suddenly people had access to cars, uh, uh, increased personal mobility, which enabled them to spend time in, in the countryside and to make sense out of second homes. And um, so this was then the impression changed the British countryside quite a lot because suddenly there was a pressure on rural housing uh, and um, and that created unrest. It created almost riots in, in Wales, a part of the UK, and, um, and second homes were mainly understood and for, uh, kind of framed as a problematic new asset, uh, a problematic new phenomenon, I should say, in the countryside. And the question was, how can we regulate it? How can we deal with it in one or the other way? Um, however, in a way, when, when this book was launched in 1977, something has happened. Um, because it was suddenly not anymore a problem. And the reason for that was simply the fact that we had the oil crisis in the middle of the 1970s. And... Um, and suddenly a kind of traveling into the countryside was not as popular anymore as it was in the early days. So in a way, this kind of research tradition of second home tourism research never really took off. It it was this book and then there was not so much more. 
And so when when um, when I came into the field of second home research in in the early nineties, there hadn't been any major publication for quite a while. Um, very little has been said about second homes, but at the same time, there was obviously a, a big change going on, at least in the European uh, context, and uh, which in a way contributed to to benefit second home tourism. And I listed here a couple of reasons for that. One were the demographic changes that were ongoing in Europe, meaning that people grow older and older and they were fitter and fitter in higher age. But at the same time, retirement age did not increase. So, so what happened was that we got suddenly a group of re retirees, which are pretty well off. They have quite a lot of money and they have quite a good health and they want to do something that is fun. And, and so, so they had the precondition for being able to engage in second home uh, tourism. There was also an economic restructuring in society, which meant that more and more people actually worked in service sector, in white collar jobs, which enabled them to be more flexible about where to be. Um, uh, in, in their work, you know, kind of a lawyer doesn't mean need to be at the office every day. A teacher, a university teacher doesn't need to be at the university every day. So they could also make more use out of their, their um, 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 second homes in or out of a second home investment. Technological changes also contributed. Um, I mean, we saw computers coming up, so you could take your work along uh, in a totally different way as before. Uh, so, and and of course, then at, after a while, even the, the advent of internet uh, created totally new preconditions for utilizing second homes. So you wouldn't be just away, you could be stay connected with the rest of the world and with your with your friends and family elsewhere. And of course, also modernity and globalization in a way added to this. Uh, I mean, it was suddenly possible for a lot of people to travel quite a lot. Uh, we had in the European case, we had the, the kind of the end of the, the Cold War with, the, with the Eastern Europe. So border regulations were kind of more and more disappearing. It uh, became possible for people also to buy property abroad, uh, which wasn't very easy before. And all this led to a, a rejuvenation of, of interest in second homes and also an academic review, rejuvenation of interest in, in second homes. So what we saw was simply a changing, changing mobilities and second homes became more and more also part of a housing career uh, where new mobility patterns and, and changing place attachments were part of it. I will come back to that a little bit later. And there were there were also real issues related to countryside change owing to that because a lot of second homes were in the countryside, and also what we saw and which also created actually a lot of attention was this internationalization of second home ownership, and that was something that I digged into early with my PhD when I looked at Germans buying second homes in Sweden, because that was something that was possible but very hard before. Actually, the European integration really took place or and took took speed, but but suddenly it was possible for Germans to to buy second homes. And in my thesis, I could show, for instance, that the number of German second homeowners in Sweden increased within five years in the early nineties from fifteen hundred to six thousand. That is not enormous amounts of people, but they ended up in in very small and marginal places in the countryside, and were there very visible. If we look at a geographical dimension of second homes, it's um, actually mainly outside the metropolitan areas we can find second homes. This is a map that shows the Scandinavian peninsula and the Nordic countries, Finland and, and Denmark. And, um, and you see, I mean, second homes are all over the place. This is kind of on a municipal level, it shows the municipalities, but you see there is no municipality that has not any major uh, second home agglomeration. And they. I will show another map showing that more clearly, but you see it's in um, uh, metropolitan areas and it's in the amenity rich areas like the coast and the mountains. So second homes will be found everywhere, 
but particularly in those areas, in the coastal areas and the mountain areas and around the big cities. Um, here we can look at those maps. They, they, they show it a little bit more. The first map shows the second home distribution of second, uh, in Sweden, and it's kind of a cells of 10 kilometers. And, uh, and you can see this blue um this blue concentration in the in the midwest in the mid east of, of Sweden that is the Stockholm area and on the on the other side of the country on the west coast you see uh, Gothenburg area which are the major two major cities in Sweden you see close by there are a lot of second homes and if you compare that with the information in the in the table um, on the slide the median distance is actually only 35 kilometers so 50 percent of the people in Sweden have their second home within 35 kilometers. So it's a very nearby tourism for a lot of people. And that is something that applies for all countries, more or less, that second homes often are nearby tourism. And you can wonder, I mean, what's the point of having a, a kind of a vacation home just 30 kilometers away? Isn't that the same area? Yeah, in a way, you could argue that, of course, but obviously... The property offers opportunities that you would not have in your urban home. And, and this is often kind of you, the urban home and the rural home. And, and you have rurality, the experience of rurality in, in that home. And, and that makes it attractive, even though it's very nearby. And, and you see where the permanent home are in, in the mid, in the mid uh, map. And then you see the relation of second homes to permanent homes. And you can see that the bluer the map uh, is, the, the more uh, second homes you have. And you see the kind of the Stockholm area, once again, here in the, in the, in the middle of the east there. Uh, it's kind of a big spot where you have the, the brownish and yellow colors. That is Stockholm center, Stockholm city. And the blue parts outside is the Stockholm archipelago. So a lot of second homes are actually very close by to the, to the urban cities, to the urban centers but also in the mountains which are so to say the the uh, the line that is um uh, or the, the western the western border of of northern sweden that is the mountains uh, you will find a lot of second homes i should say something also on the position of second homes in in the literature um, and also, I, what I haven't done so far is actually defining what a second home is. And a second home is actually often, uh, as Roy Wolfe would say, the guy who, who did the work in the 50s already, is that it's a purpose-built property for an inessential purpose. Uh, that is kind of an interesting uh, kind of definition of a second home, I think. Uh, so it's kind of built as a second home, he said, a cabin, a small house in the countryside built for an inessential purpose, which is leisure. And, and I think, I mean, to a certain extent, this is one of the problems that we face in tourism research in general, that it's often seen as inessential. And, you know, I would like to contrast that with a, with a quote that I had in the beginning of the presentation saying that without it, I would be half. So is that then inessential? No, it isn't. Actually, it's very essential to the people. It's extremely essential. They invest a lot of money in having a second home. And they also invest a lot of emotions into the second home and trying to get a family there and, and have these kind of issues that are a kind of ambitions that are really making it a core place in their, in their everyday life. So, so I would I would oppose Roy Wolfe in this kind of idea of that second homes are an inessential, uh, have an inessential purpose. I think they have a very essential purpose, and therefore it's not an inessential research topic. It's a highly essential research topic. Uh, so, so I think it's very important. And even today, we would define second homes as these cabins in the countryside, but. Um, that, that are there for temporary use. Uh, but I will come back to that because it becomes an increasingly problematic definition. And also, I should add, I mean, some people have also added not only these cabins, but also apartments in the countryside or in skiing resorts, for instance. Uh, they would add boats. They would add uh, other kind of leisure structures like re recreational vehicles. 
as as mobile second homes. So so there is a discussion also on what, where, and how to delimit second homes, and there is no clear definition that everybody would agree upon. Often. The definitions that are used are dependent on the statistics that are available. So they're they're defined by others, so to say, and and so so research is only a secondary user of that. Then, also a question I think that can be asked is whether second homes are homes or commodities, and um, and there's also I would like to add or I would like to point to the Norwegian geographer Björn Kaltenborn who already in the late 90s uh, wrote a couple of papers where he argued that second homes, in a way, are alternate homes because people actually like them a lot. Without them, they would be half. Uh, they like them a lot. And even other researchers in the US, uh, like Richard Stedman and, and Dan Williams, uh, kind of uh, also saw that people attach very closely to second homes. And I think for some, in some, in a Nordic context, for instance, I mean, in many cases, second homes are heritage and a, a, a heritage, family heritage. They are probably the houses where people have grown up in the countryside. And then because of urbanization, they moved away from the countryside, but kept the property and went back to the place where the parents had grown up or lived, uh, where, where people were buried and so on and so on. So, so it's this kind of link to the roots of the family that that uh, made it really also home but it's also really this kind of how people behave there there are several studies that underline that these second homes are really homes to to their owners and not only a commodity but i should add there is also another trend showing that there is a geographical polarization of second homes that uh, it's uh, also so that uh, certain places are more attractive for second home ownership. So it's not only the places where people grew up that become second second homes, you know, these kind of family places. But there are also attempts to create new family places in, in honey pots, in, in spots that are really attractive, like mountain resorts or beach resorts, and where people pay often higher prices than they would pay for a kind of a permanent housing. Uh, which creates a, a lot of tension. So we come back to that as well. Okay, I will shift a little bit to mobilities and uh, then tie that together. But first I take a little sip of water. Okay. Um, we are obviously living, I mean, as I already stated, I mean, uh, a precondition for, for second home ownership was the fact that... Uh, people could become more mobile. Uh, borders became more per, kind of permeable and um, and people had more money and, and it became cheaper to travel. And that enabled them to, to, to be away much more. And there's this idea of a new mobility paradigm that was put forward some 20 years ago by a couple of, of uh, researchers, uh, geographers and sociologists and and what they saw and what they realized was that there was a global mobility of people, commodities, information, and ideas um, that became more and more formative for societies and communities. And it was kind of in a in a great contrast to sedentary traditions within social sciences, where people always would be assumed to be stable and 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 put in place, and where mobility was seen as the exception. Uh, John Ari, one of those guys who, who promoted uh, the, the new mobility paradigm, I mean, he argued that in, in the 21st century, people would get their identity not in relation to a place. They would not say, I am a Swede, I am a Japanese, or I am from Hokkaido. They would say, I am a mobile person. And they would get their identity from being mobile rather than from being related to a place. And um, and that was kind of one of his ideas. So so mo mobility was kind of becoming more and more an identity marker for, for certain groups. And we can see that today. I mean, we're talking about digital nomads that are kind of the protagonists of, of these kind of ideas of mobility as an identity. I mean, where being mobile, being the nomad is kind of a, a very important thing to the people. 
But we shouldn't underestimate as well, of course, that a lot of people still today are very immobile. So it's uh, it's also a question, of course, why people some people stay immobile. And similarly, in even in, in tourism, more and more direct tourism research, I mean, people like Michael Hall have picked up this idea at the same time, in a way. And he launched uh, or he published this book, which I still find a very good introduction to this way of thinking that is called Tourism as a Social Science of Mobility. Also putting mobility at the center of tourism research and, and saying more or less that um, that everything that is tourism is related to mobility. And, and I think that is still something that guides me very much in my thinking about tourism and tourism geographies. And mobility is then kind of these spatial and uh, kind of uh, um, different kind of activities that are, that are ordered along spatial and temporal lines or continua. Um, and I come back to that, I think, maybe already in a, in a, not in this slide, but in the next slide. And if we if we think of, of mobility rather than migration and tourism, I think we should also we need to to look at I mean how these um, um, uh, parts you know distinguishes itself from each other or, or how they where the differences are in between those and and this Bell and Ward article from two thousand um, from tourism geographies I think is is a very uh, core one in 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 doing so and I mean they they compare permanent migration and temporary mobility uh, according to this table and um, where they say I mean permanent migration is usually there is no intention to return uh, but temporary mobility may involve a, re a return to home somewhere and uh, and the duration is then uh, lasting a relocation if it comes to permanent migration but if it comes to mobility I mean it, there are variations in in terms of how long the stay will will last and so on and so on. So so there are some differences, even though, I mean, in, in this kind of age of migration, you could argue these kind of differences become more and more blurred. Because most people who migrate, they don't do so with uh, uh, for permanent. I mean, in Sweden, a person migrates 10 times during this life course in on average. So, and with the average age of 85, uh, permanent is then 8.5 years. <laughs> so so it's not very permanent in a way. It's also temporary. That is what my point would be, yeah, that the migration and, and, and other mobilities are, are very much, um, I mean, migration is not that permanent and not that outstanding as, as it, it kind of made in the literature. It's rather about mobility, which is kind of ordered along a continuum. And, and this is kind of... Uh, a table that is also taken from from their their paper Bell and Ward paper, and uh, it shows how how different forms of mobility can be ordered uh, uh, along these two dimensions of time and space, and and different forms. And you can see here in in um, in this table. Uh, a lot of a lot of different kind of aspects, but you could also see, of course, second homes. It's not put in there, but actually it could be put in there, and and where time can vary very much between, um, yeah, day visits to to visits that last couple of months, and it can be local, but it can also be international and national. So so second homes, you could almost argue would would be found all over this kind of chart. Um, and there is kind of a, um, um, uh, simply kind of a, a development that, that we can see where, where this kind of second home uh, use becomes more and more intensive and important. Uh, and uh, Alan Williams, um, he, he quoted that in in a paper then that that second homes they become very much important in the life strategies of people they become these kind of shifting notes in escapes and flows of migration and tourism as he argued where second homes often also are you know future destinations for a permanent migration 
So you start relocating to another place by first going there to your second home. You, you buy a property, which is a second home. You go there for vacations. Maybe if you retire, you go, you go more, maybe a little bit off, more often for vacations. And maybe you, at the end of the day, you migrate there. So, so they can have these kind of in-between roles as well. And 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 take up different roles in different times of of a life course, and and where they're also important to to um, 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 keep together families and and uh, and for for social relations. Where when we ask people, for instance, in our research, how many people their household has, um, which is kind of a question you would usually like to know i mean how many people are there in a second home people would often not be able to answer that question properly because they would answer not only the household that they were today but they counted also in their, their children and grandchildren and their their in-laws and so on everybody who would come to the house and and, and then it was so so to say the entire clan the entire big family that was calculated and not only the kind of the, the core family. So we saw that there is kind of a really a topic here. And, and as I said, I mean, there is migration towards second homes and particularly in outside the, the big cities, but also in these more amenity rich areas. And and uh, all these kind of things made uh, a British geographer, uh, Neil Gallant, uh, ask whether there would be dwelling hierarchies, whether there is really reason to talk about a first home and a second home, because first and second indicate some kind of hierarchy, saying that the first home is more important than the second home. And... Um, and here's an argument about that, and we come back to that uh, pretty soon, but... If you look at homes overall in second in, in social science research, they are hardly mentioned at all. If you look outside the tourism literature. Um, and and usually I claim, for instance, I mean, this is one of those books that has come out in some 20 years ago, which was kind of in a in a uh, kind of pretty important then social science geography series on on core core concepts in in uh, in research and uh, home was this book it doesn't mention second homes at all they were not there and and i think partly this was because population geographers and housing researchers they were very much assessed obsessed with administrative units and measures uh, they didn't see any space for for a deviation from that and the other reason was that um, it was an inessential phenomenon and uh, it it was a deviation that was not liked. I talked to one researcher once, Keith Halfakri, a rural population researcher, and he said, I know that there were second homes, but I dislike them because they are only owned by rich people. And I, I don't like that idea. So I have I have neglected them, he said. But then I came to Norway, he said, and I realized they're not only owned by rich people and you cannot neglect them. So, so I mean, he had made this travel to realize that this is not a necessarily a, a um, elite uh, kind of um, phenomenon only but rather a folkloristic phenomenon in a couple of countries but i think for some more marxist uh, researchers they were there they didn't see that as a necessity it was inessential and therefore not really worthwhile a study and, and in a way, I mean, that brings me back to this idea of immobility as a norm. I mean, this fellow is a Valgentin, a kind of a Swedish uh, administrator at the time in the nine, in 1970-48. He was the first person in the world who invented population statistics. He said it was important to keep track of the population. And in a way, I mean... It is still the logics of that kind of invention in uh, innovation in the, in the mid 18th century that is still the norm, namely that uh, the people are living in one place, and when they move, when they are mobile, that's the deviation of the norm. Uh, otherwise, they stay in one place. And of course, I mean, today, I think this is very much related to the fact that we have a hard time of measuring mobility. And um, if you look at tourism statistics, they're often not very good. They're often not very trustworthy. They're often, uh, you know, kind of collected in one place, but not in the other. You have a hard time to follow people. So we don't know so much how many people are around in different places. And I think that 
contributed to make this kind of idea of mobility as a deviation from the norm so long livity or long living. And but as I, as I said, I mean the mobility turn in the social sciences in a way brought a change to that by pointing out mobility as an essential part of it. This fellow is uh, is often a, is a guy that is often mentioned in this context when it comes to kind of arguing that homes can be acquired and, and you can become at home in different places as well. And it is Martin Heidegger, a German philosopher, actually a Nazi. Uh, so I don't like him at all, and um, and I think also he's often cited in the wrong in the wrong way. But but I mean his his he he wrote this kind of idea or he wrote this this essay bauen wohnen denken dwelling uh, um, or uh, building dwelling thinking it's called in English. And and what he says is that in in that essay is that if you if you build something you connect to place. If you build something, you connect to place, you become a local. That is more or less the, the message in it. Meaning that if you transfer that, and that Neil Gallant has done it, if you transfer that to a second home context, if you build a second home, if you if you invest in a second home, your emotions, your work, then you become a local. And then from that point of view, you can ask yourself, is it then reasonable to talk about second homes? Aren't there just homes in, in kind of a, a network of homes rather than having a, this kind of ordering of it? And I think that is a very fair point. I, I would usually agree with that. And it's also, as I said already, I mean, it's shown with this place attachment. It's shown with family roots because second homes are sometimes buildings that are never sold. They are handed on over generations. And isn't that then a home? A place where generations kind of return to once in a while all the time, independent whether they've grown up or not. Um, and you have these kind of family roots, you have this continuity of, that, that lasts over generations. And, and for some people, it's also retirement residence. So, I mean, there is this argument that, that second homes aren't really to be seen as secondary homes. They are just alternate homes. They are just another home. And there may be as some people also said, maybe the true second home, uh, the true first home, or some people said when we talked about it in our questionnaires that we did, it's the home of the heart. It's where your heart is at home. But still, if you look at statistics, this is never visible. We can never see that. Second home populations remain often invisible. And one of my doctoral, previous doctoral students, he did a thesis on how second homes are treated in planning. And most of the planners, they don't know how many second homes there are. Uh, they have no clue about it. They do not know who owns them. They do not know how often they are used. They do not know the economic impacts. They have no clue about them. They, they remain visible, invisible in, in the statistics. And I think that is kind of something that we are very critical about and and where kind of a mobility perspective where we do not take this kind of sedentary kind of idea of people living in one place becomes very much um, uh, a, a tool for understanding and seeing second homes in a different way. And And we ask people, this is in Swedish, but I will translate it to you. We ask people to what extent they feel at home in their primary home and in their second home. And the blue staples say in my private, in my in my permanent home, and the, the, the pink staples say in my second home. And and um, the highest staples says there it says we feel they're very much at home. And the very low staples say we feel not at at all at home there. And you see, I mean, the differences between the second home and the primary home are very small. So people actually, when we, when you ask them where they feel at home, they will say, yeah, more or less, we feel at home in both places. And, uh, and I think that is an interesting kind of evidence for, for this argument that second homes are not secondary homes. They're just another home uh, in, in a, a kind of a situation where people can afford several homes. Okay, <clears throat> now we bring try to bring together second homes and and um, 
and mobility and and that is best done in local communities where those meet in a way and uh, just uh, to I, I won't be comprehensive here but i mean just to to make also ads for for colleagues who have done work on this kind of topic i mean we are talking, I mean, in, in this idea of having several homes, I mean, it's sometimes talked about as multiple dwelling and, uh, and multiple dwelling. And, and there are several ideas of what you could be looked at in that context. I mean, it's about the motives and the meaning for the individuals who engage in this kind of multiple dwelling strategies. Uh, there are a lot of studies on place attachment, how they relate to this. I have talked about that uh, they are often this kind of uh, studies on what it means for the local community, how it is for the individuals, but also how it is kind of portrayed in media images and so on. Um, so, so there is quite a lot of stuff on on that topic actually available today. But one topic that that we are studying in in Sweden quite a lot, or did study quite a lot, there's another doctoral student of mine and now a colleague of mine, Roger Maria Wara. He, he um, kind of wrote a thesis on, on what we call the displacement debate. And the displacement debate was very much related to what we already saw in the 1970s, if it comes to second homes. You remember I talked about this, I showed you the picture of this book, of, of Kopuk, which more or less said, uh, I mean, the second homes kind of invade the countryside and, and uh, will... You no know, people from London was his argument. They pay high prices, and the locals could not afford to live there, and they need to move out. They are displaced, and that is still a debate that comes up uh, wherever you go. That second homes are seen as intruders, and they kind of push out locals from the countryside. And uh, so we did uh, ask, um, uh, or we we studied the Stockholm Archipelago outside Stockholm and looked at where the people actually would be displaced. So we sent out, among other things, a questionnaire to everybody who has moved out from an island that was identified by authorities as particularly the target of this kind of process of displacement. So we, everybody who could possibly be could could possibly have been displaced got a uh, questionnaire. And we asked them why they moved. And nobody and nobody mentioned second homes. <laughs> so, so in a way, I mean, what we found is was no, the ones who were displaced, they didn't feel displaced at all. They had often moved for education, for family reasons, uh, for being urban rather than rural. Uh, so they had a lot of other reasons. But it was the ones left behind who said they were displaced. So, so that was kind of an interesting notion and an interesting insight that we gained by studying that. And and in in this debate, I mean, it was the logic of of displacement is often this kind of idea that there is a high demand for second home that displaces local people, and and simply because the local people cannot compete with uh, with the prices that are paid. And uh, and so what happens is that rural areas that are attractive become more and more elite landscapes. And uh, that is the logic of that. But we are kind of more uh, kind of uh, supporting this, this opposite side, and uh, which is more this kind of idea of rural change and that second homes are more a symptom of rural change rather than a driver of rural change. And, and where we argue that second home owners are simply the ones are filling the gap caused by out migration and, and, and also that living in rural areas is actually attractive during certain seasons in, in, in the north, at least, uh, where, where certain seasons are attractive. Otherwise, it's very hard, particularly if you are in a, in, on an island and you have to, to sail uh, to, the, to the mainland in order to get to a workplace and so on. Um, and and so we argue that kind of forcing people to rest, reside in a certain place is not really a solution for a weak local rural labor market. And uh, and as, as um, actually Neil Gallant said uh, in a later paper, he would argue then that, OK, he would admit that there, there is rural change ongoing. And he would argue that the problem is actually not that people are displaced. The problem is probably then that 
uh, the incomes that you can gain by being uh, working in rural areas are so low that you maybe cannot compete. That's maybe the problem, that you gain so low incomes in, in the countryside rather than that there's a housing market. But this was a big debate and it comes up Wherever you go and, and look at second homes, you will find that debate. Uh, in Sweden nowadays, it's a little bit not that that much um, voiced anymore, but still there. And and uh, I think if it's it's also important in relation to to uh, uh, to second home research, to get more in the rural into it. I mean, we often have not really reflected about the geographies of of where people are when they are in the countryside. Uh, if we look at uh, the Nordic countries, at least, I mean, most second homes are in a rural context. They are in nature. They are kind of in green spaces where you have lakes, you have forests, you have meadows. So it's very green and it's very nice. It's very rural in a way. And uh, and second homes are, are, of course, consuming these kind of assets and uh, and also, as we as this figure shows, I mean, a lot of people today, at least, have kind of good memories of being in the countryside, um, and and it says that uh, your impacts you know, of the child ex experiences of the rural areas they are very they are kind of very influential if you are grown up, even for your decision to buy a second home. That is what the figure says. So, so that is, I think, an important thing that we that we really also think about the places where these second homes are. But I think it's also important to get the, the second homes into rural research. And, and here this map is kind of a, an exercise that I did many years ago by now that was on, um, on uh, where, where I calculated uh, kind of an alternative population account where I integrated second homes into the population of the local municipalities. And I simply calculated every second home as half a person uh, by, by knowing that Swedish second home owners would usually stay about 70 days in a second home and they would be up to three people. And uh, let's say three times two months is uh, six months, it's half an in inhabitant. So, so I for every second home that was in a municipality, I added uh, half a person to the population. And for every second home owner who had a second home in another municipality, I reduced the number of population with half a person. And, and what, what you can see in the map is that the bluer the, the places, the great, the, the, the more benefit the, would the, the, the places benefit from such a way of counting population. And you see the red dots and or the red municipalities. And actually, the red municipalities are actually all the cities because they would all lose. They would all lose from that. Uh, but but uh, kind of the, the mountain municipalities, the, the, the ones that are on the on the north, middle blue uh, on, the, on the west west side of the country, uh, they they are they would gain quite dramatically. And also the one municipality outside Stockholm and Uppsala in, in central Sweden on the east coast, Nortelli municipality would actually gain by more than 20%. Uh, so there, I would argue they have 20% more population that we usually would count. And that is quite a, a lot. And and it, it implies quite a lot for those municipalities as well. Because it's very important to have those figures because it's important to understand them in order to understand local property markets, uh, service supplies, service demands, uh, all these kind of things are dependent on that. And we did another study later on where we asked, I mean, how, how companies and, and how public sector is adapting to this kind of demand of second homeowners. And they do that quite dramatically, actually. Because they need to, because they suddenly need to provide services during summertime in most places uh, that they would usually not uh, uh, offer to the local population. But simply because they have the fact that they have more people there during summer uh, implies that they need, for instance, more social workers helping with uh, home care, for instance, for old people who are going to the second homes during summertime. 
And uh, in one municipality of, on the West Coast, they actually needed to buy boats during the summertime in order to reach all the old people that were suddenly be there. But they had no idea about how many they would be because they had no register on them. It was always ad hoc uh, solutions that were that were kind of set up when people kind of simply applied for getting that help. And and the municipalities are are need needed to to contact or to to provide them, but also firefighters and so on needed to have a much greater presence during summertime, despite the fact that the locals were always gone because they were on vacations. But actually, there were another population coming in. So in a way, you could argue in some places actually second home owners form the rural community. They make up the rural community. They are at least a very important part of it. And they're also, in a way, and I mean, that is, we have shown in other papers, they're also a link to urban places. Uh, they link even the ones who maybe do not have a, a natural link to an urban place. They link them to the urban place simply by being the ones who are being mobile in between. Uh, so there were a lot of added value also provided by second home owners because they provided in a way temporal uh, kind of competence clusters in certain places that would not be there uh, otherwise. So or what you can see, I can give a, another example from, from winter tourism from where you have a lot of second home in skiing destinations. And actually during winter time, you have a lot of doctors there. Not because they would like to be doctors at the time, they are on the leisure time, but at the end of the day, they can be called in because they're going there skiing. So actually the, the medical, the medical, the access to medical doctors is much better there during winter time than during summertime, simply because you have tourists who can actually, at the end of the day, if it really becomes a crisis, they can combine also these kind of things. Okay, I come close to the end now. And, and this is something that I'm really into at the moment. And those maps are in German language. I will explain them a little bit first. But, but obviously, I mean, a question that is very important in relation to second homes is what happened during the pandemic. Uh, because I mean, as you all know, and um, I think um, uh, uh, in all countries, I mean, there were more or less um, uh, various kind of mobility restrictions put in place. I don't know what was possible in Japan. In Sweden, we had pretty liberal regulations, so we could move around in Sweden. We could not go abroad because other countries didn't like us to be there. But in Sweden, we could move around quite a lot. And, and that uh, meant um, that because people were not allowed to go to the workplaces, uh, we are all were kind of going online, and as you probably did as well, and uh, and and that meant, of course, number one, kind of a, a great increase in our capacity to work from online, and uh, that is kind of lasting until today. I mean, this session is obviously a, a indication of that, but also what it meant was that there was a big discourse about what that meant to these places that had a lot of second homes. But because what we saw was that when people couldn't go to the workplace, many of them went to their second homes and lived in their second homes during the pandemic. Because it's rural and rural means not so many physical contacts to others. So you escape the pandemic, you, you escape the, the crowds, you escape the disease. So what we saw was a, a lot of Swedish households went to, second home, uh, to their second home. And at least that was reported in the, in the newspapers, and and it was also the other the other side of the discourse was of course that they they were taking the disease from the from the urban city to the to the countryside, <laughs> so not every every rural dweller was very happy about uh, getting a lot of urbanites into the countryside, but but I mean what what we do not really know is what happened. So, and, and what I'm currently doing is that I utilize data that has become accessible in Sweden quite recently, and that is cell phone data. And you remember that I earlier said, I mean, one of the problems that we have when we uh, would like to study mobility is that we don't know where people are. And I think this is not anymore true. 
Today, we have totally new sources of information. It's not only cell phone data, but it's also internet data, social media data, which often is geolocated. So, so we can actually track people in space, in time and space. And in the Swedish case today, I can buy uh, data on cell phone use uh, from a Swedish, uh, major Swedish cell phone company. Uh, so, so they can actually say, will provide me with data on a quite a detailed geographical level in cities, but also in the countryside, which allows me to say how many cell phones there are in place at certain times of the day, of the week, of the year, and so on and so on. So actually, for the first time, I can look back and see now what happened actually during the pandemic. Where were people uh, during the pandemic? Where did they spend their time? I cannot see so much more out of the data, but I can see how the, the population distribution is. And this is what those maps actually are saying. The, the map to the left is actually showing just where those second homes are in northern Sweden. And uh, the, the, the gray houses actually show the amount of second homes per municipality. And the, the red dots show really the amount. And you see, I mean, it's very empty. It's a very empty space. It's a very peripheral space where, that you see the north of Sweden with a population density of less than a person per square kilometer of, of in, in vast areas. And then the, the map to the right shows actually the change of, uh, of uh, mobile phones in the areas uh, in, if, between different years. Um, the green ones show the difference between 2019 and 2020. So in the early, in the early parts of the pandemic. And, uh, and there you see that some municipalities in the inlands and to the west have an increase in, in presence of people, or of cell phones, I should say, to be correct. And that is exactly what, what, what these kind of discourses say, that people actually went to a greater degree to those places where they have the second homes. Uh, meanwhile, actually, the total mobility that decreases in the countries or in at the coast, I mean, more or less shows that the big cities were the major uh, destinations that were suffering from from um, kind of the pandemic because nobody could go there. Even people from elsewhere, from other regions, couldn't go there. But those places in the countryside had actually a better development and and were more more or less refuges uh, during the 2019-2020 period and, and also the 2021 to a certain extent. So what we can see is that this, this actually meant something. But now I'm interested in, in to see to what extent these second homes really turn in the future. I mean, now when we have learned to work online, now when we have learned to, to have a lot of teams and Zoom meetings, whether this actually will change how people organize their lives and what role second homes play in such a setup. So that is very much what I'm onto at the moment. So look at, at this and, and to see to what extent, in a way, mobility becomes really this kind of merging factor. And, and to see, I mean, um, whether we have this kind of mobile lifestyle or not. And, and I mean, a lot of people have done that for single individuals, for single households, but they were never able to, to have this kind of more comprehensive picture. So this is what I would like to add, this kind of comprehensive picture of looking at kind of the impact of the pandemic on how we organize our lives and to see what role second homes play in that and to what extent it really, in a way, means this kind of transition to a mobile lifestyle rather than a sedentary lifestyle. Uh, so it's at the way, in a way, I mean, it's at the edge of tourism, you could say. It's it's maybe the end of tourism, some would argue. Or or it's it's kind of, you could also say the other thing, which is that, in a way, I mean, tourism has become very mundane. It's a very, it's a part of the everyday. It's something that we do all the time. Uh, it's another way of seeing it simply. And I would I would usually say that, Tourism, I mean, being around, being touring is kind of a part of the everyday. And 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 that is makes it even more important to study it. Um, 
So just to find the slide with an outlook into the future, I think, I mean, I'm still, you know, even though this uh, mobility paradigm, new mobility paradigm has been around for 20 years, I'm actually not very happy about how it has developed. Because I think uh, Ari's ideas and Hall's conceptualization of mobility, they have not been really embraced by the research community. Often it, what, what it led to was this kind of kind of studies about how it feels to be mobile, you know, kind of more from a humanistic point of view, emotional point of view, looking at how it is to be mobile. And also it it provided a lot of a lot of uh, commuting studies where people commute to work and what it means to them and so on. So so in a way, you could argue that the mobility turn created a lot of old wine in new bottles. Uh, and 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 that also meant that tourism and mobility are still seen in social sciences as the exception rather than the mundane, rather than the everyday. And um, and also what we still see is that spatial fixity is seen as the norm, not mobility. Uh, but I think now, I mean, when we have this kind of new possibilities, new ways of looking at mobility, also empirically, with new sorts of data, we can really push the borders and our knowledge on mobility forward in a way that we weren't able to do historically. And, and I think from that point of view, it's really, I would really like to make an argument that this kind of new mobility paradigm, it's maybe now we can actually rethink the social scientists, sciences, departing from the notion that mobility is maybe the norm rather than the exception. Yes, and I think that's what I wanted to say. So thank you for listening. Hey, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, so it's mind blowing for me. I write the whole page of <laughs> comments and questions. But okay, now we have some time. Uh, we would like to, oh, Jen Hong is the student you will provide guidance before in our university. Yes. Thank you. So thank you, Professor Muller, for your brilliant speech. I'm very interested in this topic and I learn a lot of new concepts from your presentation. I have a question to ask. Uh, does second home tourism, where tourists become owner of local property such as land, challenges of the traditional definition of tourism as a temporarily moving one place of resident to visit another place? So that's the first question. Maybe let's do it one by one. Mm. Yeah, and I think absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's kind of, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm critical about how we, how our social scientists have kind of departed from this notion of, of sedentarism in a way that everything is kind of fixed in space and place. And 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 I mean, in the same way, I have to be, of course, then kind of critical towards uh, tourism as well, uh, in a way, as because I mean, we have also understood tourism as something that is very exceptional. It's something that we do during summer times only. And I mean, I was uh, at many conferences where people also argued, this is not this is not tourism. Second homes are not tourism because they the people have the wrong motives. Mm -hmm. But if you go back to the science literature, the tourism literature, I mean, motivations have never been a defini definitional part of what tourism is. Um, so we have always also talked about work tourism, you know, kind of business tourism and so on. So, so it was never really a part of it. I mean, for me, and that is how I understand tourism, it's the most the social science of mobility. And of course, this is in, in uh, to a great degree kind of a mobility phenomenon. And, and from that point of view, I see it as part of tourism as well. And also, I mean, there were arguments historically that even if you have a, maybe a destination perspective. There was a paper from the US um, many years ago, actually, that said, I mean, if you if you would like to understand a skiing resort, um, you need to also account for the second homes because they actually represent uh, most of the accommodation. It's not the hotels, it's the second mm -hmm. homes. So we'll never understand why there is a, a lift system in place if you don't look at the second homes as well. So so in a way, even and, and, and the transportation and so on. So even from that point of view, it's a part of tourism. You cannot understand 
so to say, the pure tourism, if I, if I say it like that, uh, without having a look at the second homes as well. So, so yes, it is challenging, challenging how we uh, conceptualize tourism. I think it is really challenging, but for me, it's it's a part of it, and and I think I have good arguments for that. Okay, another question follow up is how does the local culture harmonize with tourist culture when tourists become the owner of local property, mm -hmm. and they also have a uh, legal rights to declare uh, their lifestyle on that land? Mm. Good question. Very good question. And and it's actually a debate that is ongoing in the literature. And uh, there are different accounts of it. You know, I mean, some people would argue that actually, if you look at the second home owners, they have often very similar interests than the locals. And partly it's maybe in, in a Nordic context, at least it's not so strange because it's people from those areas who return to those areas. So so they are, they are impregnated with these kind of ideas, how it is to live in that particular place, uh, you know. But but I mean, there are there are certainly tendencies towards uh, second home owners who want to safeguard their investment, who are more conservative in relation to land use issues, for instance. Um, simply by, you know, they don't want to have a factory nearby or kind of industrialization nearby or wind power station nearby because they bought an, an, an idyll, an idyllic place. And, and so they do not want to see that destroyed. Uh, but even there, I mean, they sometimes go hand in hand with the locals. So, but, but I mean, there are differences. They can occur. And of course, I mean, if we talk about international second home tourism, it becomes maybe even more extreme, but also in, in very different ways. You know, when I looked at German second home owners in, in Sweden, I mean, they bought into a Swedish idyll in a way. They had an idea how it is to be in the Swedish countryside. But actually, the Swedish countryside is pretty modern. And people, what they do during every day is to move out from the countryside because they need to work in towns. And and the Germans coming in, they wanted to live idyllic with small shops and so on, not shopping centers. And and so so they recreated in a way this kind of Swedish idyll, even though they were Germans. And um, and they went to the small shops, while the Swedes still continue to go to the big cities buying in the, in the cheaper shops. You know, so so I mean there are different behaviors, there are different. Um, um, uh, ideas about it, but it seldom has led to conflict. Uh, I mean, in, in the 1970s, when this Kopok book, this, this original book was written, I mean, they, they talked actually about riots in the Vase countryside. And, and there were obviously a couple of second homes burned down even. But I mean, today, that is very seldom the case. And, uh, and often, I think, um, when you have these kind of problems, it's often more a result of poor planning practice in local municipalities. Because, I mean, uh, you do not need to uh, provide uh, the, the, the right to build a second home, you know. I mean, it's still, still in all countries, there's, or in most countries, there's some kind of planning legislation there. So, so often it can be solved in a, in a different way as well. So, uh, but there, there are very few conflicts. And, you know, even, I mean, a colleague in South Africa, Gustav Fisser, uh, he wrote about gay people moving into a kind of a conservative rural village where gays maybe are not the norm. And even that wasn't the problem. You know, people were in the beginning, they were skeptical about it. But then at the end of the day, they see these are people coming in, investing into place, you know, kind of uh, renovating buildings, uh, you know, keeping the houses in a good shape. Uh, garden, kind of have nice gardens and so on. And actually, in most cases, the alternative is not somebody who lives there permanently. The alternative is often an empty house. And now it's at least populated during some parts of the year. And, and that is then by many people embraced. But there are shades of it. Uh, that should be uh, clearly uh, kind of stated. There are shades of it. So it's different in different places. Okay, thank you. So we are also welcoming other kind of question. Before our next question come in, I would like to share some background about Japan. Uh, mm -hmm. but what, um, my research is very limited with uh, the rural society. A lot of people come from Tokyo and Osaka. They want to relocate and become a ijusha, which means a newcomer in the rural places. And very often they are facing the difficulty of finding houses. 
uh, because in rural Japan, they need to gain the community trust. Uh, it takes some time. It's not like mm-hmm. you can come to a place, you just buy a land and build a house. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a long process. And sometimes the, the house owner is not willing to uh, sell it to strangers. They rather want the house collapse and mm-hmm. back to the nature. So, but the, the part of the lecture is really uh, kind of uh, uh, inspire me, especially when you talk about the, the differences between lifestyle and short-term stay. Uh, in Japan, they also uh, recently this this tried to move to a new trend of building share house. So that yeah. means a temporary accommodation you can stay before you are looking for a second home, something yeah. like that. So uh, yeah. it's mostly done by the MPOs. Uh, I hope this some information can help you. And I yeah. have a, a few questions. On my, I, I'm really curious about the seasonality because we mentioned about summer and winter. And do those uh, second home owner or we call them tourists in this context are they kind of a travel by seasonal or more follow the holiday or depend on their situation it depends actually i mean the major the major decisive force is uh, where the second home is mm. in relation to to the other home i mean if it's close by people would go there all the time mm. uh, the entire year you know uh, maybe a little bit more intensive i mean if i i mean i, I talk now about Sweden in in particular, and Sweden is kind of climate wise, uh, kind of a, a country that has real winters, you know. So there is a clear seasonality in terms of the physical the physical landscape, and we have a lot of snow and so on, mm. and and cold temperatures and so on. So, so I mean, seasons are very important to people. But uh, if the second home is close by, they will usually go there by. Um, uh, the entire year, more or less, maybe a little bit more during summertime. Mm. Um, otherwise, I mean, it really depends. Seaside homes, obviously more popular during summer. Uh, mountain homes uh, have a strong winter season. But but I mean, location is one thing. But the other thing is that um, it's your, your, your work condition. You know, if you're off, I mean, if you're retired or, I mean, you go there the entire year. You can choose when to go, uh, mm. while other people, particularly the ones with children, are constrained by the school holidays. So right. they will still go there, yeah. even to to even to mountain homes. So they we'll go there mainly during the summertime because they have more time during the summertime. Mm. During winter time, they have one week vacation. They will go for that one week, and then they will go for Christmas, which is another week. Mm. But that's it. You know, they they don't have more time to go there. So there are these kind of time time space constraints. I mean, if you have this kind of time geography perspective on it, uh, so that makes it actually. Uh, very tricky to say. I mean, it's really place dependent on on where it is located in relation to major mm. uh, population centers, and and then also what kind of owners you have. You know, whether you have kind of aged owners or where you, whether you have owners with a lot of kids. Mm. Uh, that that will affect how the second homes will be used. But I will learn more about that in the future. I mean, you know, I have just started to dig into this kind of cell phone data, but they would actually in some places allow me to actually say on an hourly level. Wow. That's, uh, that's... How people are there, you know. Mm. Okay, before my second question, I also encourage our audience to to ask more questions. We, uh, tonight is not only academic here. We also have people from uh, from local government in Hokkaido and also the people from industry. If mm-hmm. you have any question related to second home, and please feel free. Or if you're considering uh, develop second home in Hokkaido, that's a perfect opportunity to communicate and mm-hmm. before the new question coming and my second question is very common question probably so it's about before and after COVID-19 did you see any pattern shift after I mean th- that was what I was showing is that during the during the pandemic we did see mm. um, kind of a greater interest in second homes and it was also I mean I could show that partly with the cell phone data but it could also be shown actually in property statistics, in, in property market statistics. So mm-hmm. there was a, a great interest in buying second homes, actually. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and uh, so we have seen an increase there. To what extent that lasts will be remains to be seen. You know, I think, uh, I mean, some people talk about revenge tourism. I mean, now after the pandemic, I mean, you haven't been able to travel abroad and you maybe are keen to travel abroad again. Mm. 
that is one thing I think. Uh, something that I wonder about, which I don't really have an answer to so far, is of course that. I mean, during the pandemic, I mean, if you think of international second home ownership, that is also dependent on often cheap flight connections, you know, that you have a flight from Northern Europe to somewhere in Spain. And a lot of those airlines obviously went out of business or rescheduled their connections. Mm. So suddenly this flight that goes from your hometown to this town in Spain where you have a second home maybe have disappeared. Mm. <laughs> and and to, to what extent this has actually affected uh, the travel patterns and the use of second homes in this kind of international space Base, I don't really know, but yeah. I think it's a kind of it would be an interesting topic to look at uh, um, uh, a little bit more. So, so I think there are changes, and 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 what I'm particularly interested in is this kind of this. I mean, you know, where I'm today. I mean, now we have this Easter week in Sweden. A lot of people are off; they are not here at the office. Okay, and but they are not on vacation. You know, they, they are just elsewhere. And and elsewhere is in many places the second home, mm -hmm. uh, where they work from another home in a more pleasant environment and not in an urban environment. Right. Uh, so and 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 to what extent this is happening is something that we today only can guess about. Uh, or guess, yeah, we, we don't know. And and I, what I mean is that I mean using alternative data. Uh, mm -hmm. that we usually have not used so far and it becomes more and more readily readily available will enable us to answer these kind of questions and make more reasonable assessments of, of what is happening. Right. Okay. We have another question, Hari, ah, from uh, from Finnish. A neighbor. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your extra, uh, extremely interesting presentation. As a Finnish person, the topic of second home is very close to my heart. As it is the place that I almost always return to when I'm going back to my home region in Finland, I'm really interested in the idea of primacy between first and the second homes. In the Finnish language, we usually prefer to second home as a summer house, mm -hmm. houses, even if they are also visited during winter. I was wondering if there is a similar kind of language used in Swedish. Uh, the second home thought of as alternative homes that in a way become primary homes seasonally and for mm -hmm. example during the summer and the winter holidays is there any existing research regarding to the social linguistic aspect mm. interesting I, it's a very interesting question and and i wouldn't say there is a lot of research it's, it's commented on i would say there there are comments on that and and i mean in sweden no we wouldn't talk necessarily about a summer house. I mean, the Danes would do, the Swedes would not. Uh, we would usually talk about a, f f f a leisure home, fritizus. And uh, so um, that would be, our, which is also strange because today it's not only used for leisure, it's also used for work. And uh, and some, some people would anyhow argue it's a work camp because there's so much work to do always at the second home <laughs> for maintaining it and so on. But, but I mean, it's we we have this kind of distinction for for I mean leisure and work in a way where we would say it's a leisure home rather than a work home which is obviously than the other home, um, but but I mean there are different words in use and I mean um, uh, some people would all, in the English language in New Zealand Australia I mean they talk about crofts and cribs uh, kind of a more more relating to the form of the building uh, or cabins in in Canada they would talk about cabins to go to the co cabin or the cottage mm. uh, so it's more the form of the building rather than the function or or the, the season so mm. there are different ways of, of referring to it uh, um, and um, and uh, and you can see that also partly in the in the literature, actually, I mean, in the scientific literature, and I mean, I've, you know, spent quite a lot of time about thinking how I could actually call that. And I mean, whether I should go for alternate home, which I think is actually quite a good term for it. Mm. But but on the other hand, I mean, the literature has dominantly used second home, and, and that is why I stuck to it. But I mean, there's also a substantial body of literature today that talks about residential tourism. Mm. kind of indicating that this is kind of 
almost being like a resident of the local area and also kind of indicating the often long duration of stays mm. and uh, and so and this is particularly in relation to northerners going to the south you know i mean kind of northern europeans to the mediterranean or or north americans to the caribbean or i don't know whether people go from japan to jeju island or places like that and buy something i don't know that but but i mean that would be kind of comparable in a way right yeah uh last week i was uh, did a field work in goto island uh goto archipelagos close to jeju island near korea yeah. And uh, we find out a lot of Korean fishermen come to the island to do fishing. Yeah. But we, we couldn't call them the, the do second home activities. No, 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 no. It's very interesting. Yeah. No, and I thought, I mean, it was a very interesting comment that you made earlier about, about you know, kind of situation in Japan, that it's very hard to, to buy property. And that is in a way, you know, I think that is in a way a way of regulating it. And where I said, I mean, you know, you get problems right. if you don't regulate it. And yeah. and so I think that is kind of a a way of dealing with it, of course. Mm. But um, uh, so so I think that is totally fair to do that. And and I mean, um, it's a little bit, of course, culturally contingent and so on. And, mm. and I think in a way, in a European or Western case situation, I mean, we have we have a relatively liberal kind of regulations there you know we would mm. usually not be able to make a distinction between whether it's a local applying or non-local applying mm. uh, for for a permit or so right. and and at the end of the day i also usually say you know i mean every every property that is converted into a second home mm. has also somebody who sold the property you know, somebody mm. who decided to sell it as a as to a other a person from the outside. Uh, nobody is forced to do that. That's actually right. the individual greediness <laughs> to, mm. to 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 score the highest price that makes it. You know, right. and 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 in a way that is that is a part of of the Western lifestyle. You could argue. Mm. Um, so so it's. It's not always the ones who buy something that are to be blamed. It's I mean you could also talk about uh, the ones who sell mm -hmm. properties who can be blamed for a certain kind of development if you would like to blame them for that. Yeah. And one more uh, information I want to share in, in that island, because the border island, they have a special policy. They want to re-attract uh, people from the urban area. So therefore, they provide tons of funding for people to create business to come here. And this has caused a new problem because a lot of people come here is not because they want to move here, just because they want the money. Yeah. That's yeah. a lot of things we can continue to talk yeah. about yeah. this. Yeah. And, and I mean, mm. yes. what we can see here in, in terms mm. of second homes is often that places who have second homes, uh, they are rather happy about it mm. because number one, they have a housing market. If somebody, mm. you know, we have a lot of marginal places in the periphery mm. who have the problem that everybody is moving out. So you wouldn't get mm. anything for your house. You would wow. not even get money from the bank to build a new house. But if mm -hmm. you have a second home demand, then there's suddenly a market there, which mm -hmm. enables people, even the locals, to, to invest into their property because it's not worthless. Uh, they can they can score or gain a certain price for it on a market, which mm -hmm. makes it attractive. And the other thing is that simple, I mean, this that second homes also equal an additional demand that maybe is there only seasonally, but, but still it's there. And that also means often a better service supply of public and private services, actually. So, mm. so for some, from that point of view, I mean, planners are often kind of more positive towards second homes rather than negative. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. We are just on time. And uh, thank you for your wonderful lecture. And we are also looking forward in future to hear about your other researchers, such as indigenous tourism and community issues. And uh, okay, here is the night time. I guess everybody is already tired and have a great evening. And thank you, Professor Dieter Muller for providing such wonderful talk about second home, uh, mobility and uh, tourism. Thank you very much. Thank you okay. very much for having me. Yeah, thank you. Uh...